want to kind of remind you uh, of what uh, the COVID pandemic uh, is looking globally. Uh, you know, at least from what we know from testing, about 214 million people have tested positive. Uh, tests. Uh, this is, these are positive tests. Uh, and my guess uh, is that this number is actually double that or even more. We have a lot of countries who are not testing uh, and that's it. Uh, but if you can see here, the number below, uh, 4.476 million is the number of people who we have lost, died as a result of this pandemic. So that's, you know, even though it's only a small percentage, but when you look at the global population of 7.5 billion, we have lost about 4.4 million people to this disaster called COVID. Uh, that's one thing. And then, uh, if you look at here, the daily new COVID cases, uh, that was the wave one, this is wave two, this is wave three, and we are in wave four. Okay? And uh, this is the total cases. And look at the daily deaths. If you look at the daily deaths, uh, you can say maybe this is wave one, two, three, four, maybe we are even going up to wave five. Now, most of us uh, are vaccinated. Uh, we still wear the mask and we do all the social distancing and everything. But uh, nobody expected when we were hit with COVID January, February, March of last year, that August 2021, we will still be talking about COVID and we will be talking about a fourth wave. Okay? None of us, even the epidemiologists, the, the world experts, nobody predicted that this virus is going to sort of unleash uh, this kind of a prolonged misery uh, on the world. Now, I'm going to specifically talk about the Delta, the, the Delta variant of the virus, because there's a lot of confusion about what this Delta variant is. Uh, I mean, it started off with the original COVID-19 strain, uh, and uh, within the first to six months, it had already mutated. It had already mutated into three different strains. You know, the South African strain, the Kenny strain, you know, there were various strains that had mutated. But the most, but the most significant mutation came out of this mutation called the Indian variant, called the Delta variant. Uh, now they're stopping naming, you know, the mutation from countries. They're kind of labeling it or the mutation. So the Delta variant <coughs> appeared uh, sometime, uh, you know, in uh, February of this year, and it started off in India, where large populations, you know, the disease was sweeping and killing a lot of people. Uh, and that was initially called the Indian variant, but subsequently subtyped and it's now called the Delta variant. Now let me tell you something about the Delta variant that all of us need to be aware of, and why the, the graph is, is, is the way it is, okay? Mm -hmm. The Delta variant has got two peculiarities. Uh, one, it has got uh, a, a, a spike uh, on the corona spike protein that is 10 times uh, more effective in penetrating human cells. Uh, so when you talk about uh, the reflex of the R rate or how quickly the, the virus spread, uh, let's assume that the original COVID-19 strain was uh, a one. One means if one person is infected, I can spread it to another person. So that's how the coronavirus spreads. And I always have told you repeatedly, the most infectious virus that is known to man currently circulating around is the measles virus where the R is 15. So if one person is affected, he can infect 15 people. So that is still the most infectious pathogen followed by smallpox and all of that, which is, you know, almost extinct now. Now the Delta variant, Delta variant has got an R factor of 67. So if the original COVID was one, the Delta variant is 67. So it is that much more time, more effective in penetrating our human in the epithelial cells to, you know, uh, to hang on, multiply, and then cause disease. And, uh, you know, in January, February of uh, this year, if you looked at the world population uh, and of the vaccination mm -hmm. rate in, in the various parts of the world, uh, there were only two countries that really had any significant amount of their population mm -hmm. vaccinated uh, to any degree. Uh, one was the UK, the other one was the US. Uh, even though a large subset of the southern uh, population of the United States are still vaccine, anti-vaccine mm -hmm. people. 
Uh, and so as soon as the Delta variant uh, began to spread around the globe, you suddenly saw uh, you know, this spike uh, and then the subsequent spike of new cases developing. And uh, in those countries where vaccination rates were low, the Delta variant or the virus was more capable of killing people. Okay? So the average, and we saw that in Bahrain as well. Last year, this time, the average length of stay in the ICU of a patient with COVID seriously sick was about 18 days. Currently, with the Delta strain, it is seven days. Okay? Seven days, you're gone. If you're critically ill and you're ventilated. But last year, it was about 18 days, meaning that uh, you still had some hope of uh, trying to salvage someone. So, without a shadow of a doubt, the Delta variant is, is much more uh, significant in actually creating damage. Now, we in Bahrain are very fortunate uh, that. Uh, Vaccination rates are high. Vaccines are freely available. You have a choice of three or four vaccines. So you go onto your app, you know, and within a couple of days, yeah, you can mute the. Yeah, mute every, uh, mute every. So you can go and get yourself uh, vaccinated. And this is one of the reasons why vaccination rates are relatively high in Bahrain. And certainly, when it comes to our population, uh, our AMH population, uh, Jancy just said that 100% of our staff are vaccinated with one dose is certainly greater than, you know, 80% are vaccinated with two doses. Uh, and stop people sharing. Stop sharing. Put under the green. Highlight the green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop sharing. You can stop sharing. Yeah. You can just stop. Mm -hmm. Mute all, yes. And you can stop sharing now because I don't need the graph. Uh -huh. I don't need the graph anymore. Yeah, that's perfect. So uh, what's happened is, so uh, within the organization, we are all, most of us are double vaccinated, and old people like me uh, have signed up to get our booster doses. And uh, let me actually advise you something about the booster doses. Uh, you know, CDC has already declared that uh, people who receive either Pfizer, the biotech, or any vaccine now, after six months, your immunity will begin to wane. Uh, and with the new variant, especially the Delta variant around, you're much more susceptible to illness. So that's why they are now suggesting to get the, the booster dose. So any of you who have got yourself vaccinated and six months after you've had the second dose, uh, get yourself your booster dose. I'm, I've signed up to get my booster dose because with the booster dose, there is an 84% chance that even if you're exposed to the Delta variant, uh, you might just have a mild illness, but you will go nowhere near a hospital and certainly you won't be admitted to the ICU. 98% of all ICU admissions and deaths in the US is from unvaccinated people catching the Delta strain. So pretty much every patient admitted into the ICU now is has got the Delta variant and almost all of the deaths, this is now one and a half years with all the technology, sophistication, drugs, uh, steroids, everything that's available, there are still people dying even though the death has actually leveled off, but the people who die, regardless of what you throw at them, these people will still die. And, and it's because of the Delta variant. But those of you who are vaccinated, or those of us who are vaccinated, the chances of ending up in the ICU and dying is significantly less compared to those who are unvaccinated. Now, there is a phenomenon that is happening in the ICUs in the US, and it is very troubling. And that is, uh, ICU staff are literally walking out of the ICU. These are physicians and nurses who work here. Uh, you know, they are these are doctors and nurses who work at the ICUs for all their careers, uh, have worked for 20 years. Literally what they're doing is they're pulling out their stethoscopes, putting them, changing their uniform, and walk, walking out. They're not even they're not even giving notices. They're walking out, and this is a phenomenon that is now beginning to spread in the U.S. They are already short of ICU staff, and the reason why they have started to walk out is because these physicians and nurses have put their lives on the line to save other people, and now what they are seeing is 
despite them putting their life on the line, there are people who say that, you know what, they're not going to get vaccinated. And they end up in the ICU, and you expect physicians and nurses to save their lives. And these people are saying, enough is enough. Okay? So you will read uh, in the news about increasing mandates of vaccinations being compulsory. This, this morning I heard about Delta. American Airlines had already announced all of their staff will have to be vaccinated, or you stay home unpaid. Delta has come into this today. Uh, unvaccinated staff cannot serve in the front line. And they have to pay $200 uh, per day to get their PCR test done. And the next step is going to be staying at home. Uh, all of the US military personnel mandated to have the vaccine unless there's a medical contraindication. Uh, federal employees. So there is an increasing push to have the government for mandating that vaccination should be compulsory. Why did it come to this? It came to this because a group, and this is a very vocal group of people, who are anti-vaccinators saying that this is all a conspiracy theory and whatever else, uh, resisted being vaccinated. So even in those countries where vaccination rates were high, uh, the COVID had a chance to spread. Uh, and you've heard now in Bahrain, they're vaccinating children over six years, and that's going to be universal all over the place. Uh, and in a lot of universities, if you're not vaccinated, you, you can't have, you can have an online class, but you can't be in class in present. So there's an unprecedented wave uh, that is sweeping the globe now uh, compared to last year. So this August looks very different uh, to August of last year. And yet, there are countries like the UK and the US maybe trying to come out of this COVID shadow. Uh, US is still doing it a bad way, partly because the death rates are very high in the US now. Admission rates in the ICs have gone up. But the UK seemed to have kind of dodged this uh, with uh, high vaccination rates. Uh, the Delta variant is still there. And uh, the number of cases are up, but the ICU admissions have stayed down, at least for now, unless there's a fifth wave with the new mutant that is, you know, sweet through. So the message in this, what I'm trying to give is this. Uh, we have a responsibility to our fellow human beings. We have a responsibility to our community. We have a responsibility to the world. I mean, this is not some isolated little infection that's affecting a few people, and some of us can say, you know, I'm not going to vaccinate and do this. But this is a global issue, uh, and global issues can only be solved by the solidarity of the world coming together to fight this. And I'm so glad that at least in the American Mission Hospital, uh, most people have heeded uh, you know, like anything, when, when something is new, you have your suspicions, you're worried, and that's normal. But I'm glad to say that most of you have gave it to this fact, and have got yourselves vaccinated. Uh, for those of you who've got children going to school, okay, the, the prevalent uh, virus strain in Bahrain is Delta. So if your child gets sick at school with uh, COVID, that's going to be the Delta strain. Okay, and depending on your vaccination status, if the child goes to school and comes back, the chances are, even though you're vaccinated, you could become unwell with COVID. Uh, so despite the fact that you are vaccinated, what I would urge, and then this is going to be another thing for the task force, our task force here, is that if any of us feel unwell with uh, either body or the <coughs> symptoms uh, of COVID, we need to get ourselves tested and quickly isolate ourselves so that we don't spread the infection because these waves are not over yet. And already the newer strains, mutant strains are, you know, the, you know, the epsilon and the lambda strains are already being recognized in two or three parts of the world. So this shadow of COVID will continue and be with us at least for the next uh, one year. And I'm talking about, uh, you know, August of 2022. Uh, we all thought by summer of this year we would be over it. Uh, and you will find that COVID will become endemic. No longer will it be a pandemic. It will become an endemic like, uh, you know, much of the infections that we deal with. Uh, and the only way people have to protect ourselves, certainly healthcare providers, is maybe take an annual shot. Like we take a flu shot, you might have to take a, a COVID shot. Uh, that's going to make a lot of pharma companies very rich, I know that. But the only way we can protect ourselves <coughs> is to get that flu shot. So this is, I'm just giving you the science behind the trajectory of how people a modeling of how COVID is going to sort of sweep through and finally burn out to become an endemic 
and we're going to learn to live with, uh, you know, COVID. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, this thing on our faces uh, might become a fixture uh, for quite some time to come. Fortunately, uh, in Bahrain, uh, they have still mandated using this. A lot of countries in the UK, US, there's no mask or nothing, and you can spread this. Quite easy. And this is how, you know, we used to have influenza spreading from shaking hands and uh, coughing and, uh, you know, spreading it. But this has actually protected us from even catching influenza. Now. In the incidence of influenza, is known that. Infection control people know this. Because hand washing rates are high, uh, faces are protected, we don't rub our face, uh, and those of you who have glasses will not even rub your eyes. Okay? So I just wanted to sort of leave these thoughts with you because uh, as the chief medical officer of this organization, uh, I read a lot, uh, and yet there are times where I reflect on where is AMH now at as part of the global, uh, as part of the, the country where I think, and how is it that we can actually have a clear strategy to sort of get out of this COVID shadow? Uh, and I, I would say that just be patient. You still will have to, I mean, a lot of people are having parties at home and, uh, you know, parties with the department. I will still not allow any parties within the department unless there's a small gathering of people who are all vaccinated, you know, double vaccinated. And then you can sit together and have a, a vada or gosha, whatever you want to have. But otherwise, please be careful. Uh, it, it's still not time, it's not party time as yet, okay? Uh, and uh, I finally want to leave you with uh, something that I've read about uh, centered leadership. And I will actually read it to you what centered leadership, but I will read it slowly so that you can take in the words that I read to you. Uh, there are various forms of leadership, but what is centered leadership? Especially at a time like this where people's minds are all over the place, their emotions are all over the place, and yet you need leadership which is very much focused and centered. And this is what uh, the author writes about centered leadership. Okay? Uh, centered leadership is mastery of your thoughts your feeling, your actions, in pursuit of profound changes that you're hoping to enact in the organization or the community in which you lead. Let me read that again. Centered leadership is mastery of your thoughts, your feelings, your actions, in pursuit of profound changes that you're hoping to enact in the organization or community in which you lead. So, when we talk about leadership, uh, at a time of profound change of, of anxiety, you know, the VUCA is very high now, a very highly volatile. The situation is very complex. We, we can't see through the fog. You need to have complete control over your feelings. You need to have complete control in how you speak, in how you act, and have a very clear idea of what AMH is all about, what our mission is all about, and what our vision is all about. It's not about our individual likes or preferences or dislikes. That's important. But we need to think beyond ourselves for a greater purpose why you know, we are all assembled here together. 600 employees, amazing employees, different talents have come together with a unified purpose of delivering on our mission and on our vision. And if you can actually take away this message of centered leadership and make this part of your own growth, then we as an organization will actually come out of this COVID storm pretty well. Thank you, and have a good weekend. Thank you.